All right, folks. Hail and welcome back to another episode of Midgard Musings. I'm joined today once again with my friend and the Gothi of the Hridgar folk, Mr. Eric Wordweaver Shervin. Go ahead and say hi, Eric. Howdy, folks. Uh, <laughs> this is Eric Wordweaver Shervin. I'm Gothi of the Hridgar folk here in East Texas. And uh, Jesse and I've done a couple of videos together here over well, the last couple of years now. And we've been been doing this for a minute uh and I, it's always a blast to be on the channel so jesse thank you for having me on today dude i am definitely looking forward to this conversation thanks man yeah so have i so folks if you haven't yet as we always do right before the show starts right before the discussion takes place since eric is here make sure you first go over and subscribe to his channel all of his uh channel links and, and social media uh platforms his facebook um the, the word weaver productions group all that will be down in the description so First of all, make sure you go and subscribe to Eric. Uh, and then, and if you haven't yet, subscribe to Midgard Musings, ding the bell, so you always get notified when I, you know, put out new stuff. And just whatever you do here, do the same for Eric. So <laughs> I have been looking forward to this as well. So this, today's discussion, guys, is uh, going to be kind of like a, as Eric mentioned earlier, uh, before we got on here, a sort of roundtable discussion. We're just going to be talking about some things, but I think something that is on our hearts and minds a lot, not just myself or Eric, for instance, but a lot of folks out here. And, and the subject being of, um, you know, in times that we're in right now, global pandemic situation, a lot of social distancing taking place, things may be starting to loosen up a little bit, but for the longest part of six months now, it's been a very strict and different lifestyle that uh, a lot of us are, are being, uh, you know, I wouldn't say pushed into, but that we're kind of having to live, you know, so we wanted to talk today, Eric and I, about this, uh, you know, dealing with uh, or, or being able to maintain or, or even start uh, a tribe. So we're talking about tribal heathenry in, in times of uh, social distancing. So I have been looking forward to it. That was a little bit of a long intro, but I'm, I'm Eric's the Eric's the word weaver, and I'm the uh, the word dumper. I don't know. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, dude. It's what we do. Yeah. So the first thing that uh, I think a lot of folks may be trying to um, do now, uh, especially with the whole social distancing thing where quarantined is um, either starting a tribe themselves, maybe wanting to look for a tribe to join, you know? So I think the, 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 the focus would be like starting afresh, starting new when it comes to, you know, either building your own tribe or starting your own tribe because the way the way we understand it right we, with the ultimate focus being on <clears throat> we have we have our own individual luck right we're talking about pretty it's, i would say like not 101 heathen stuff but we're going to start we're going to start talking about things about luck and what that luck means and uh we have our own individual luck but then you have the tribe's luck which is a a collective right so you don't want to do anything that's going to start off the tribe and then not having strong luck attached to it. So, you know, Eric's had his uh, tribe, the uh, Hridgar folk, now for how long? Like a decade or longer? Uh, I believe we founded back in 2010. So I think it's where we're, I think we're right at 10 years this year. Matter of fact, I think this month marks our 10-year anniversary. I got to go back and check. Uh, I'm not wearing that shirt from LATP, but I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was LATP 2010 that we uh, we kicked off Redgar. Oh wow! Well, happy anniversary to Redgar if that's the case. Very Thank you. I'm, I'm like I'm, I'm like now about 98% certain. I need to get on the horn and talk to my people and be like, "Hey guys, <laughs> we got an anniversary." Yeah. So you know, Eric, I think um, you know. Anybody that, that we, I think you and I collectively or individually have, have talked about the, the, the you know, building of tribe and that it can't be something that's forced. It has to be something that naturally and organically. Very organic. Yeah. yeah come, it comes, but it, it comes from community. So without a community to, to build that tribe from, you're, you're like skipping steps, putting the cart in front of the horse, um, as it were. So I think that has an important thing to do with with the right. Luck of the tribe, right if you force something yeah. it's like yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're talking about, I mean, before we even get into the subject of how do you build a tribe or develop your tribe or even support your tribe, 
in, uh, in the era of social distancing. And it's a globalization to say the era of social distancing. There's a number of social elements that go into kind of where the world is right now and what all we're dealing with. So I mean, we can refer to it as that, but we both understand there's, there's a lot more than just social distancing oh, in yeah. play that has to be taken into account when, when you're dealing with trying to protect your tribe. We can get into that in a second. But yeah, when it comes to starting a tribe just naturally, uh, it's difficult for newbies, especially, or even seasoned heathens that are looking, they just feel that sense of need to belong and they want to be part of a tribe so bad and they want to just rush it, you know, they get so excited about the concept. Uh, and, and unfortunately, a lot of them haven't had the experience of tribe and whatnot before. So they, they want to build too fast. They want to, to start you know, they get a group of friends together and then immediately want to start throwing names at it and uh, setting up a structure and all this stuff. And they haven't even really had the time to establish worth or to build friends with one another. And uh, almost almost every time those things just fall apart. Uh, so I mean, before we even can discuss how to do it in social distancing, uh, start resisting that urge to rush. Yeah, you got to walk before you run, man. Yeah. Got to walk before you run. Uh, that I completely agree. That tribe has to grow organically and slowly over time. Uh, you can't just can't just rush it. You can't just throw at it and and make it happen. It's not going to work that way. Uh, that my my big thing is you have to grow the roots deep for the tree to grow. If you grow the if you grow the tree too fast without a root system, it's just going to fall over at the first yeah. wind. Yep. I mean, if you so you got to take a minute and let the roots set, and That's then. Good. Then yeah. you can grow. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of how it started, like, for me, you know, for instance, I, I, I had not been looking, to, even though there were some, you know, local kindreds or tribes in, the, in, in my area, when I was looking to be, be a part of something, right, belong to something, um, they weren't, they, like, the, the, their, their tribal structure just didn't fit what I was looking for specifically. And I had nothing wrong to say about those folks. It's just, it wasn't fitting for me. So I, you know, a lot to do with, with Eric's uh, channel and, and some things he's talked about with, you know, building tribe and stuff, took a lot of ideas and inspiration. He was a big inspiration for, for me. Um, so once the community got built, which was done through a social media, you know, social media was a big part in getting that community. But we actually had to then meet in person, right? We, we can't just say, oh, I've got 100 people online in my, you know, heathen community, and then let's build a tribe out of those people. Like, mm, there has to be that physical oh. element. Yeah. Which is where we I get to the social distancing thing that makes it challenging more than others, because you can't maybe, uh, you know, uh, aggressively seek that, that, that closeness, that physicality. Right. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen people on like uh, heathen forums online or heathen Facebook groups were the worst. Uh, they'd rock along and then all of a sudden they would decide like a local, uh, somebody's local group would be like, okay, so this is, you know, uh, middle of nowhere, uh, Texas heathens. And then uh, they would get just enough people on there to show interest, maybe have a meetup or two, decide they were going to be friends. And then just instantly turn the Facebook group into a tribe. <laughs> and uh, I have no idea what, what they were thinking on that one. And it, it, I've seen a couple of groups do this and it just flabbergasts me every time. It's like, you guys actually need physicality for this to work. You know, you, you can't do a virtual tribe and it be an actual tribe. You, know, you can have a virtual friend group, but you can't have a virtual tribe. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's a lot of times where people get uh, maybe not maybe not confused, but they get uh, misled. You know, they think, well, I've been talking to this person for so long. You know, you can get to know somebody really well without having to physically be so. You know, be be, in, be like in person. Like, let's say me and you, for instance, right, Eric? Like, we've talked online and we've collaborated virtually um, for a year or two now, right? We've yeah. gotten to know one another and that our conversations have, you know, developed and, and, and we talked about various things even offline. Um, but still, there, there's, there's, there, you get a sense of, of what, could, what Frith could possibly be, but you right, don't actually right. get that true 
that true feel that, that that actual thing right there's a there's a palpable difference between the physicality element when you're actually sharing energies and mm -hmm. when you are using the conduit of the internet and that's that's something that i plan on exploring some a little bit in some of my future videos um off and on as a subject is you know the whole uh in the modern era modern heathenry you, how much exactly how much energy do you conduct through uh, virtual channels and you know spoiler alert the answer is very very little if any at all because uh, mm -hmm. there's a number of disconnects there's a number of channels there uh, there is a psychic connection so to speak but not really um, yeah. it's more a psychological connection than it is a connection anyway mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah the whole physicality thing I mean you we know from firsthand, there, there's a total difference when you actually get to meet someone in person and interact with them and build energy that way versus doing it over the internet. We do the best we can. We have a lot of fun with it too. Oh yeah, yeah. And I think I think it's very telling. I mean, it does. Uh, it does. I mean, this is a form of our self. You know what I mean? It, you know, it's not that physical self, but it's a simile of it, and it's uh, it gives us some sense of like who you are, what kind of person you are, where your head's at, that sort of thing. Right. But for one, anybody, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say, one of the things that I think people forget when they're talking about like the virtual interaction with people and uh, assuming virtual frith where it doesn't really exist, uh, I, I see there's no such thing as actual virtual frith. There's actual frith and there's not. <laughs> but uh, on the internet, uh, everything goes through a filter. There is, uh, there, there is the filter of production time. There is the filter of, you know, the period of time between writing and hitting send. There is the, the filter of persona that a person may be putting on uh, for a short period of time for like a video call or something like that. And then once the call ends, they step out of that character and back into themselves. Uh, you really never know what's going on on the other end of the screen. I mean, if you look at some of your favorite celebrities and stuff in movies and whatnot, you can get a false sense of that uh, kinship with them. Yes. That, again, false kinship thing that I keep coming back to on myself. And you start to assume that you know them based on the persona that's been presented to you. And then, you know, you go and you follow one of them on Twitter and you find out that they're like way out there crazy and are just you nothing like you actually expected them to be in real life uh, that can be true that anybody online because that some people will do a lot to look real good online and to keep their persona they will manage that brand really well mm -hmm. and uh, you can have a, a, a relationship with the brand but you don't know the person and i've seen some people that are just absolute troglodytes online and then are great people in person so uh yeah. they they, they really embrace that online troll thing. And then in person, they're just puppy dogs. So I, it, it goes either way, but they, you got to keep that in mind as you go through. You never really know the person on the other end of the line until you actually spend some time with them uh, and, and figure it out when they don't have the buffer of the internet between you and them. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, for, for anybody that's out here that maybe getting that itch you know they, they're like i i want to experience that closeness i want to exchange those energies i want to be able to understand and build and maintain frith we'll be talking a little bit about that and, and the illusion of that online um but they want to get to that and now we're in this time where it's like well you know a lot of people are very uh very aware and very cautious of how they interact in person with other people of course there's barriers and things that we can uh, maintain and, and distances that we can maintain. How much do you think that it's really impacting what it means to, to, to experience tribe? How much do you think that it's averted people from doing anything or, or maybe, I don't know, like what, what's your, what's your thoughts on it? I'm kind of curious. My thoughts are, my, my thoughts are that one, um, there are certain elements to the social distancing thing that are overplayed in the popular element. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to get into some of the specifics on, on, on you know, politicizing the views and everything on it. Yeah, but uh, 
in keeping with the ideology of you know keeping people safe and uh, not not over risking uh, the cross contamination, uh, most tribes are small enough that they can gather even without violating the whole number of gathered individuals. I mean, there's enough parameters set within the guidelines of the whole social distancing aspect that you, you can still get a group of people together. You can still sit in your front yard. You can still converse. You can still have a great time and spend time around each other. Uh, and still, yeah. you, you can maintain your six feet apart. You can wear your masks. You can do the hand sanitizer. You can do all of these things and still be able to interact. I mean, we go to work every day, uh, at least those of us in essential industries that, that don't shut down for anything. Uh, we didn't shut down a single day throughout any of this. I've been at work every day uh, yeah. throughout the whole thing. And so I mean, we make it work. And, and because we've done that there, I know how to do it at home too. Yeah. So the main hiccup that I see so far with Tribe is that it has really brought into uh, a kind of hyper-focus, the necessity of localized physicality. Uh, because I have tribe members that are spread throughout. Um, I've got one set of my tribe members lives three hours from me. And uh, three hours is a bit of a distance. It's also uh, several counties over, which means they are under different guidelines. Mm -hmm. And so when, like, my city would be on a soft lockdown, they're on a hard lockdown because they live in a very, very urban area. Uh, yeah. And when that kicks up, it then plays in a whole different element on whether or not they can travel that three hours over here to a completely different biome uh, than what they have going on there with regards to infection rates and, and, and everything. So it makes a lot of travel because we have to take into account everybody's jobs, everybody's, uh, you know, our livelihoods in general. If anybody's got ailing family members or elderly family members, uh, because there, there's certain things that we would be willing to do if we were just considering ourselves. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the, the, it, anyway, <laughs> like, I don't want to talk too much about the particulars because then everybody will get up in, up in the comments. But uh, the, the gist is that there are legitimate concerns with COVID-19, very legitimate concerns. And that is enough for us to say, you know, maybe it's best y'all not travel the three and a half hours over here uh, to set up because you've got a whole different scheme of exposure over there than we do here. And we have entirely different variables. So we're not just connecting the people we might normally interact with on a daily basis. We're connecting contagion possibilities from two different cities, uh, from two yeah. completely different biomes. And so we've had to cut back a lot on, uh, on the travel from more, some of our more distant tribe members. And that's, that's the part that's really, really hurt the most. Because my localized tribe members, it, it's still nothing for us just to kind of pop over and see each other and meet up in some place. And we can observe social distancing and all the rules and everything. But it's not the hindrance that it is when it comes to like a distance traveled tribe member. Yeah. And under normal circumstances, without all the social distancing stuff, we would never really think about it because it's nothing for them to jump in the car and drive three hours over here and, you know, spend the day with us or for us to jump in the car and go to them. It's a totally different thing when, you know, one three-hour trip might cost you two weeks of work or more, depending on the scenario. So I, it, it, it gets dodgy on stuff. And uh, that's, that's the part where I see the main impact. Um, there are some impacts as far as uh, ritual and things like that goes. Yes. Uh, the largest one being symbol, but I figured we'd probably talk about ritual elements here in a little bit because uh, yeah. that's a whole topic of conversation itself. But as far as the generality goes, uh, some minor mechanics, which we'll talk about here in a bit, and then uh, the, the regional proximity has really been brought into laser focus for me. Uh, it, it is made very evident to me that I would love to have all of my people within a 50 mile radius of each other. I, I, I think that would change things considerably. Mm -hmm. But so, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how I see. It. I mean, what about you? I I'm in line with you on that. And I've actually gotten to think more lately, um, you know, because my situation was, you know, we had uh, 
some folks of the of the community that we uh, deem to be very close but within our inner yard it, you know they, they came and they celebrated Yule with us earlier we, we do our Yule on in, in the, the the beginning of the year a little bit more focused to the actual like historical uh, pre-Christian uh, pre hawk and the good kind of uh, time right. frame of when Yule was observed so anyway, yeah, yeah. When, we, when we got Yule, when we did Yule, we um, announced the the formation of the Claridi folk, the, our tribe here in Middle Tennessee. And a month and a half after that was all of a sudden it's you know shelter in place and pandemic and so we didn't really get any time to start doing the tribe stuff. You know, like we were you know we were still doing like localized regional or localized meetups in our in our area just to kind of get to know people and, and build that, you know, personal relationship. And then from there, we were going to do the tribe thing. So the, the tribe thing really got put on halt very quickly before we even got started. But now that we've kind of been in that focus of social distancing or understanding that this may is probably like the new norm, but, you know, the new normal for a while, we're like, okay, well, now that we've got kind of had, have done it now for the last four or five, six months, we can start thinking about doing things again because it's, you know, again, very small groups of people. Um, and, and again, you know, your situation in Texas, my situations in Tennessee, other people watch and have other localized and regional guidelines and, you know, laws and stuff that they're probably having to adhere to. So it's going to be different for everybody, but I think it's important to don't just, don't let it be like, Oh, well, it's, you know, COVID we, we can't meet up. We can't do it. Don't let that be an excuse to not go and do things be thoughtful and be careful of it because like you know Eric said if you got people that are coming from a totally different uh, geographical location where things could impact them way more differently that ties back to the luck of the tribe right not you don't want to do anything that damages anyone's luck or, or damages the luck of the tribe and just be, be considerate right like don't 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 do things that are just so selfish that it, it makes it makes the whole situation bad so I think the lesson that I've kind of taken away from this whole thing is that you can't replace the actual, you know, personal physicality of tribe. You can't replace it with anything. Um, but in times like this, when there's other, it's a dynamic that we're not used to, uh, you just kind of have to adapt to it and, and think outside the box, more or less, which I kind of like that it's forcing us to do that. Um, so we talked earlier about like what Frith, we, we've talked a lot on both of our channels, I think about what Frith is and I, and I, people can go back and search either of our channels to find things that, you know, I think you actually did one, uh, Frith versus Grith or Frith as opposed to Grith and or getting the yeah. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did one that was kind of an intro into Frith versus Grith and it's just a, it, it's a lexicon difference. But. Yeah. But it'll give it'll give newbies especially, or it'll give uh, people who maybe are using the terms incorrectly, meaning thinking it means one thing and that it actually means another. We, you guys can check all that out. But I wanted to just kind of go over that. So, Frith has to be something that's between two people or between multiple people, but in in person, there has to be that physicality. We can't we can't experience what the meaning of Frith is either through a Zoom call or through Facebook or through any other sort of um, online platform. Not, not truly. Like Eric said before, I think it's either it, 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 there's real frith or, there's, or it's not. There's no online experiences versus not online experiences. Um, but this whole, the whole thing is, you know, social distancing. Now, I think that frith has to, you have to have that physicality, but you don't need to be like, you know, up in each other's faces with it. It's that that sense of trust and obligation that is that is built between individuals. Um, so it's almost like to me the social distancing thing doesn't really truly play a factor when it comes to Frith. What do you think? Um, actually, in a way, it does. Um, in a way, but I'll let you. I'll let you elaborate a little. The, bit. The, 
it, it, it's yeah it, it's it, it's deep thought stuff but uh the essence the core element of frith is obligation uh the trust that is born that is intrinsic within frith is born out of upheld obligations uh social obligations to one another the obligation not to hurt each other the obligation to defend each other uh the obligation to fulfill whatever your role is within the social contract etc cetera, etc cetera. and it builds up over time uh and just kind of organically develops i mean you're born into frith in the family uh but you can assume frith with other individuals as you engage in a back and forth of mutual obligation mutual upheld obligation mm -hmm. and uh, so the it's kind of twofold what i wanted to talk about here but the uh on the one hand, the online thing, as far as the virtual versus real and the establishment of Frith, uh, there's no obligation, no, no meaningful obligation to one another through uh, the, the digital medium, uh, if that is your sole relationship. You may have business obligations and upholding those things like, okay, for instance, you and I set up this meeting today uh, to do this Zoom call. Mm -hmm. And if either one of us had not shown up for it, uh, that would damage our reputation in the other person's eyes, uh, how reliable we are to that person. But it's not something as intrinsic as like, you know, uh, you, you trusted me dearly and then, you know, I sold something very, very dear to you uh, and didn't even think about how you were gonna feel. Uh, that kind of stuff is a betrayal of Frith, you know. Uh, right. But this would be more of a betrayal of Gefrain, uh, which is damaging to the reputation. It functions in a, similar fashion from a superficial level uh, but that's more what we're dealing with online is we're dealing with a mixture of gefrain and grith and people don't necessarily understand the how those differ versus frith uh which, which right. you know again that that you can go back and look at the videos to get the nuances on that but uh the point that i'm making as far as how social distancing may play into Frith is at that core element of obligation. Uh, one of the obligations that you have to your Frith web is to care for their well-being and to not do something selfishly that may damage their well-being. So in essence, by not necessarily gathering my tribe for uh, like festivals or something like that during the middle of a major pandemic, or any kind of situation like this, uh, even if it was biochem agents, nuclear fallout, anything like that, uh, by saying, no, let's not get everybody together right now for this gathering. You know, uh, it'd be yeah. different if we're like gathering to help protect each other and provide food and all that stuff. And we're doing the commune kind of thing. Yeah, that would be different. But uh, for a socialized gathering uh, to say, okay, maybe we need to hold off just a little bit uh, for social gathering, uh, even though this would be something that would normally be a frith building exercise i'm looking to protect your our frith by protecting you guys yeah. by not putting you in a potentially harmful situation i'm upholding my obligation as a gothi to look after the well-being of my people and so yeah. you know it, after a fashion being mindful of these things being mindful of social distancing uh being mindful of masks and and just general uh non-infection type protocols is being mindful of the well-being of the other people in your tribe the other people in your inagarth and in doing so you're upholding your obligation to them to not do so to you know be unnecessarily risk-taking mm -hmm. in the way you do your gathering would be disrespectful to them uh, because you're telling them you don't care whether or not they're out for two weeks or more or if their health takes a significant turn or if they have any compounding issues that there could be more to it if they were to contract the disease uh, yeah. it's it's a mindfulness thing in the general concept of the the principle of the matter so uh, that that's kind of my take on that yeah no and i think you bring up a, a really good point too because um when we're talking about like preserving luck and preserving frith maintaining it it's like a preventive measure you know it's, a, it's like the maintenance you do before the problem actually arises but you have to have something already there and that's where i think a lot of people now especially if they didn't get that chance to experience something in person they're like well it's because of the pandemic and now we've got to do it differently and this is modern times it doesn't change the actual roots of it all you know what i mean it doesn't actually change the basis of it like okay well just because 
E, B, and C doesn't mean that we just jump to L, M, and yeah, more like just because it's to... just because it's more difficult doesn't change the metaphysics behind what's going on. Right. Yep. There's there's very real very very real functions that are going on here that that you can't bypass just because it's inconvenient. Exactly. And I think that that you know comes into the realm of, of, of the, the tribal leader. You know, they're they're ultimately the ones who are um, like the caretaker of the tribe's luck, as it were, and to preserve it and to make sure that it doesn't get damaged. So it's a it's a it's a very the the, the, the obligation is greater for oh yes leaders, you know oh. what I mean there there's a lot more at stake. <laughs> I completely agree. This is a this is a tough time to be a tribal leader at the moment, whether you're Dothi, a chieftain, Githia, whatever, I don't care. Uh, this yeah. is a tough time to be a leader because your decisions carry a lot of weight. Yeah. Yeah, that might be another thing we talk about later on, just, you know, varying up how obligation fits tribe, you know, tribally across all the members, but how certain members of the tribe, their, whatever their position is, how much, uh, how much higher it is and, and that might be a neat discussion we get into but i think this is probably the highlight of the conversation because i know you and i have both talked about it you more so probably than i and that is um having ritual any sort of um whether it be a bloat or uh, you know sumble we'll get into that whole thing but any sort of online ritual right i think a lot of people again because they maybe think well because we can't do it in person we just need to do it you know we just need to do something virtually so people can still experience it and what is that experience really like i think your and my opinions on it mirror each other um from what i can uh, tell yeah yeah my whole thing is like if you want to stream an event and it's like a public event you know maybe like pagan pride day or, or something like that where it's just wide open and it's, you know, people can see it without being there. That's one thing. But when it comes to any sort of, uh, you know, spiritual type activity, any sort of ritual activity, like it, that, that's where the camera stops. <laughs> Absolutely. I can, I, I completely agree with you on this. Uh, I view uh, the the camera is a window to the outside world. Uh, like when I do my videos for my channel and everything, this is a piece of my life that I am just sharing there to the everything. This is out of the troll hub and anything can happen with it. And anybody can look in on it at any time, at any point. And that's, I, that, I mean, that's why I don't film rituals at all, ever. I don't allow right. photography during my rituals. I don't allow video during my rituals. I don't allow audio during my rituals because there doesn't need to be a window to the outside. You know, when I establish the boundary around my ritual space, I do not need a window between my sacred space that I've established and the rest of the profane world. Because one, that puts a crack in the wall and things can go wrong. Two, it's very disrespectful that are in, in the middle and in play and three I mean that's a very private and deeply personal thing and you know whether it's tribal culture or hearth culture uh, that that's for you guys yeah, that's 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 for you know my hall my call my my world mm -hmm. not for the outside world uh, and yeah it, it, it gets real meh. like I'll for my channel I did like a, a video on one of my fray faxi uh, festivals at one point in time and uh, then I did another one a little bit later on for a different festival but uh, it got kind of difficult because a lot of my people are not comfortable mm -hmm. you know it, it takes a special kind of person to be like okay yeah I'm gonna get in front of the camera and talk for everybody across the you know some odd thousand subscribers that may be viewing the channel mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't necessarily want to step in front of the camera for that uh, which means I can't exactly take panoramic shots of what's going on because 
I got people don't want to be on camera, don't want to be on the internet. So I, I very rapidly realized as I'm going through here talking about these different things, it's like, I can't really show you guys what it is to be at my festival because that's a deeply personal thing. And while I would be okay with showing certain elements of it, uh, I still wouldn't be okay personally with ritual or anything like that. But, you know, I mean, I wouldn't have a problem necessarily showing people playing the games, but even that's deeply personal to them and they didn't want to be on it. So that's a that's a thing. Virtual thing, you you can't do certain things virtually. You just you just can't. But anyway, that was yeah. that's a bit more of a tangent than I think we're planning there. But yes. So ultimately, I don't think that the integrity of ritual, whether it be uh, tribal, you know, bloats to the gods or something, or or even. But like, and I, and I say stumble, right? But even though we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's like you keep the, the integrity of those. Yeah, things, stumbles right? a whole conversation. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a whole other animal. But it's like you can't maintain the integrity of those things virtually, you know. So, the, but I think a lot of people think that they can. Oh, well, you know, they can't attend this year, so they can watch it online. They're not getting the same thing out of it. You're not. I don't know. I just kind of look at it very, kind of shake my head a little bit, like, uh, not yeah. I mean, ultimately speaking, it's uh, it's a you're all your call kind of situation. Yeah, yep. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's like, you but know. But personally, it, it, it's definitely one of those things where uh, I, I agree with you. I think the integrity of ritual is compromised by the introduction of that outside window and that that technological element. Now, I don't even allow electronics in my sacred space uh, for some of the influence that it has on the flow of energy when we're actually doing ritual, uh, let alone, you know, a camera to the outside world. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, for folks that are watching, you know, I'm sure we'll see somewhere down in the comments. Um, well, actually, this, that, or the other, you know, they're going to weigh in. And, but that, we encourage that. Like, I personally like to see what other people have experienced or what other people's ideas are. And because uh, again, like, you know, your hall, your call, I'm not saying that you're a less, lesser heathen or a bad heathen for allowing this sort of thing to happen or whatever like that. That's none of, that's not our place. These are just ideas and opinions um, being shared. But um, I think that one thing that um, the, the, the social distancing thing or not the, 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 the virtual meeting Thing. I think one thing that that can do is it can give enough sense of connection with your people. You know, like if I talk to you on the phone and I see your face at the same time, it's almost like, wow, there's Eric, you know, and it's been so long that we've actually seen each other, but I can see him now. So it, it, it kind of fills a little bit of that gap, I think, uh, versus just, you know, typing messages or sending text messages or whatever. So I think there's some value to it. I just don't think that it should be something that's uh, used to replace the true meaning of tribal activity, being together, having the, right. that, that physicality to it. And I completely agree with you on that. The uh, the one thing that I've observed when it comes to, like on the subject of like Zoom calls or like video conferencing calls with relation to how it pertains to modern heathenry, uh, I find that video conferencing is very, very helpful with being able to maintain connections uh, because you can actually have some virtual face-to-face -face interaction with people. Uh, but I find it to be more effective once Frith has already been established. You can't really establish Frith over that, but as an augmenting tool to help prevent the grass from growing too tall, to paraphrase uh, the Dahavama, you get a chance to at least maintain some of that connection to keep that palpable to you and in your life. Um, I don't think that you can forge new Frith connections that way, but I do feel like it can be used to augment what you already have in place. Uh, the value for it to me is in the social cultural element of things. And I think in that kind of an instance, like with my tribe, I can do Skype calls with my people and uh, some connection is better than no connection. And uh, if you look at like Eric Woldening's uh, We Are Our Deeds, you get into the 
capable action is better than inaction. Um, in this particular instance, it's better to have virtual contact than no contact. It's better to have physical contact than virtual contact, but it's still better to have virtual contact than no contact. So it is an avenue to help kind of keep things connected, but I wouldn't try and start a tribe or establish something new and meaningful through this conduit. I don't think the quality of what you get out of it is there enough for that. No, and I'm glad you brought that up because that was actually something on my mind and I think I ran away with it talking about something else, but having that frith built already or having that frith established, having it there, has to, it has to be there before all these other things can, can well, like you say, you know, it's, it's that maintenance, keeping the grass down a little bit between between each other. Um, but I fully agree that there, there has to be that. You had to have had something for it to build off of. Um, I don't know, I think, I think one thing though, that this pandemic, the social distancing, self-quarantine, shelter in place, whatever various levels of isolation that have come about because of this thing. I think one really important thing for us as heathens uh, to focus on that this situation kind of really helped in a way in force is the focus on our individual hearth cults, our individual traditions, the things that we do with our immediate, you know, with our with our spouses, um, you know, children, um, families, people who we live with, that sort of thing. It's really like it made us focus further or closer inward. And I, if anybody uh, hasn't taken advantage of bettering yourself, working on things yourself, whether it be doing more research, studying something that would be beneficial for your not just yourself, but for your collective, your tribe, your kindred. Uh, maybe you know your own solitary work. Eric, you recently did a video about um, the, in the the solitary heathen. Um, so, you know, folks that are looking into to do stuff like that, check out Eric's uh, recent video. I'll, I'll annotate it. You guys are going to see annotated cards throughout the video. I'm sure you just click on them and then have head down to the description to see that. But you know, the isolation, the the, the shelter in place, those sort of things. That makes a perfect opportunity, I think, to, to focus on how we better ourselves, how we build ourselves up individually, which can then, that luck can help build the, the, the integrity and the luck of the tribe. I was curious what year, if, you, if, you, if you've gotten a chance to think about that sort of thing at all. Or... I, I actually have, and I'm, I'm, my, my opinion mirrors yours a lot in this particular instance. The uh... The pullback from the social element of things, the reorientation on home has really brought into focus the importance of having a strong hearth cult. Uh, yeah, heathenry begins at home. I'm, I'm a grassroots heathenry kind of guy. It's hearth and then clan and then tribe for me. And so when things like this happen and it starts to shrink your world, you know, uh, the outer folk community is one of the first things that gets cut away when it comes time to start bringing it in and protecting because of the whole you know social distancing or whatever elements and it could be anything uh it doesn't necessarily have to be the pandemic it can be any kind of element with regards to that um you end up with that outer ring kind of going away and shrinking down to the inner ring you end up with the then the tribe starting to go where you have limited access to your tribe um, that that starts to become more and more of an issue uh, it can even get to a point where clan is more and more of an issue to get together with like uh, I've got a grandparent who's in a nursing home right now and I haven't even been able to see her in like six months because of how cranked down they have the the protocols with nursing homes yeah. so hearth cult hearth cults the last bastion hearth cult is you know where it starts and where it ends, because it all comes back to hearth cult. If everything else in the world falls down around you, the hearth is what you have. Um, you know, our, uh, our uh, Amelia, you know Amelia, uh, yeah. was jumping out and doing some, some videos and some posts and stuff. Well, not videos, but posts. And, uh, you know, I, I jokingly threw out this hashtag in association with this essay that she put out that, you know, hearth is where the heathenry is. Uh, and that, 
that really kind of struck home for me when I, I did it as a joke at first. And then I was like, no, that's, that's, that's exactly. my thing. You know, hearth is where the heathenry is. And that's, that's the thing, you know, hearth cult is so important because this is a time period where you can be focusing on learning and growing as an individual, where you can focus on your home practice, where you can focus on how you do your particular rituals, how you view the world and not get sucked up into the socialized element of, you know, fitting into a tribal dynamic or fitting into a greater local heathen dynamic. You can focus on what you believe and what you think and what your research shows and what, you know, your haul, your call. You have to have a strong haul to make your call. Uh, you need a strong hearth to be a meaningful member to a tribe. So. And if you do not have a strong hearth cult, then what are you really bringing to that tribe? You know, you establish your worth at home and then you take it to the outside world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I absolutely 100%. Uh, this is a time to focus on hearth, strengthen your hearths. And then when tribe can get back together in full force, come back stronger, not weaker. Yeah. And that's, that's really something I think that could be exciting, right? Because we could see, you could see a real, you know, Kind of like a nitrous blast of your brain coming out here soon eventually when like you say the tribal thing can really kick off in full force hopefully at least because now has been a time where you know and it's and it's not just focused on on your your spirituality right or your your but you're also your morals i think too because one challenge that has uh come across from from staying at home more than all than normal is the people who we used to interact with less because of our jobs and i say uh, folks who aren't who, like eric you know you, you you still have your your day-to-day -day job i still work and but i work from home so i've been home more and, and the interactions with the people who i had less time with before now i have all my time with and that's changed you know like just personal space and, and dealing with you know your spouse or your loved ones whoever it may be just learning like relearning each other and it's like it, it, there's so much more than than just the spirituality of it and being a better heathen, but just being just bettering yourself as, a, as an individual, as a person, it, it all, it's all, oh, yeah. you, it all ties in. You hit a point where it's like, you know, you're finally at home from all of this stuff. And uh, you look at the other person and go, wow, I did not realize just how disconnected we've gotten here over the last little bit because of, you know, just stupidness with the outside world, with the mundane life and job and all this stuff sucking it away. And it's like, that we need to reconnect and uh, it's an opportunity to do so uh, you know hopefully you're not tearing each other's throats out in the process but uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> that's a thing that happens you know <laughs> but yeah i completely agree I'm, I'm right there with you it's a it's a time to reconnect at home so i think that you know there's a lot of challenges that have come across with you know being a being a heathen, right? Especially like uh, you know, a heathen focus on on tribal societal structure. You know, uh, it, there's a lot of challenges that have come up nowadays uh, with, with, within this year. Um, but there's also been a lot of opportunity as well, um, which is what we've kind of closed on, right? The focus on ourselves, the focus on our heart, because when it, when when anything else or everything else falls apart hearth is where we come back to and hearth is where it's at hearth is where the heathenry is you know which is a great hashtag but it's a great summation of it all and uh hey, let's make that a thing folks get out there yeah. hashtag hearth is where the heathenry is i'm definitely for that make a trend you know focus on your heart focus on yourselves um and then you'll only be better set up to go out and do that thing. If you are in an area, right, where, well, there's really nobody around. And I I think we both, Eric and I both have, have, have heard from people, well, there's nothing in my area. Okay, first of all, how hard are you looking? How hard are you trying? And then if there really isn't, what's stopping you from putting something in your area? Because if you are looking for something in your area, then chances are there's other people who are looking for something the same or similar, and they may be feeling the same way and you may be the one that can, you know, give them something to find. 
So I think that it's uh, I think that it's a lot of opportunity here that we all can learn from. You know, don't take advantage of the social media sites that give you a false sense of community. Use them for the benefit of kind of doing that maintenance, uh, keeping that, that connection between your, your, your folk. But um, don't be afraid to get out there and, um, you know, with, with all your senses, you know, safely and such, you know, stay connected with your people. And then ultimately keep that focus on your, on your plan, on your heart. Anything else you wanted to add, Eric? Uh, we've hit the most of it. I mean, I don't know if you wanted to talk any about some practical, just like some quick practical tips with regards to ritual during social distancing time, or if you wanted to cover that in a different yeah. video. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, well, okay. Yeah, we keep, because we keep dancing around the whole Sumble subject, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. And, you know, because like the way I see it, Bloat, bloat's easy. Bloat is easy with social distancing. You just spread out a little bit more in your sacred space. If you use a bloat tame for your offering, uh, you can come up with ways for people to put offerings into a centralized location and not have to have the contact, not have to have the, you know, the, the close proximity. You can still do that with your six foot distancing and all this. Um, and then, of course, you can make your offering. You can gather your blessing in a bowl and use a bloatane and sprinkle the people. Uh, there's there's no cross contamination going on there. You're you're not, not not unless you're like sticking your hand in it and then laying hands on. I mean, not unless you're doing yeah. that, uh, yeah. we're you know, bloatane is actually fairly socially distanced as far as the dissemination of, of blessing and whatnot. So as far as I'm concerned, bloat's a non-issue. Bloat, bloat's easy to do and still maintain social distancing. You can still wear masks while you do it if you, if you feel that that's very given the situation. Uh, Sumble though, Sumble's a different bag. And I have had people ask me uh, how to address Sumble during a, a period of social distancing, especially with the main concern of cross-contamination. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this is particularly dealing with the modern Sumble, the modern paradigm for Sumble, where it is a shared horn and three rounds, gods and goddesses, ancestors, and toasts, oaths, and boasts. Uh, a, a historical Sumble is a little bit different than that, especially you get into some of the more Anglo-Saxon uh, tribes the way they go about things there's their version of it doesn't require uh like shared horn or anything like that uh, there are depending on your your culture base uh, there are ways to go about uh doing the shared horn and still getting the symbolism of the well without necessarily everybody drinking from the same horn and obviously you know blowing any kind of protection cross contamination protections you may have taken at that point um <clears throat> largely what we've always done like especially if we have somebody in the group who can't imbibe alcohol for any particular reason whether it be for health reasons or reasons or, or whatever it may be uh, we've always permitted people to have their own horn for stumble and then we'll call it tapping in and tapping out uh they will tap their horn or their their mug to the the main horn that's going around to kind of transfer that energy and then to they'll drink from their own horn and then they'll kind of tap back the whole idea is that the words are what is going into the well and you yeah. are still symbolically engaging in that ritual with one another so you're still sharing the weird you're still you're still in that moment i find it to be i sometimes it can be less palpable but sometimes it's just as uh, it depends on the scenario and how seriously people are taking it. Uh, but if you're not all drinking from the same horn, one of the things that you can do as far as simple goes is everybody can have their own their own mug. And as you go around and do the toasts and everything, you can actually fill that mug from the offerings of everyone around, a little bit of their own drink from their own mug into the horn given as an offering. You're literally putting your energies into that well. Mm -hmm. And then that horn just becomes the receptacle as it goes around. You still maintain 
those team structure, you still maintain the sharing of Frith, the sharing of beard in this moment, the exchanging of luck, and then you use that uh, that offering maybe in the end, and uh, you know usually we gift it back to the land whites when we're done, take it out to the the local ritual spot that we have set up, and then that's that offering is made. But you can still, in the same instance, uh, you could, if you wanted to disseminate some of that back out to the people, you could do the bloatane thing like you would do in bloat, and still, you know, make sure everybody's connected to that. There are practical ways that you can approach this same kind of ritual thing. Just because it's not necessarily how it's been done, doesn't mean that mechanically it's not still serving a similar purpose. Yes. Because yeah. you are the whole the whole thing about ritual is what works. You know the why is important. Why do we do this? Why do we do it this way? What are we trying to get out of it? What is the end mechanic that we're looking for? We're looking to gather our weird into the same place, put our energies into the well, and then share that amongst ourselves. So you can go around in the three rounds and load the well, and then with a the bloat tame, you know, around, uh, or at least have all shared into that well, which is the receptacle of the tribe. You're all pouring into the tribe, and. Yeah. By that, you are adding your luck to the tribal luck, and then the tribal luck is going to disseminate out uh, from the seat of tribal luck to the rest of the tribe anyway. So there's not necessarily an absolute need to drink from a shared horn. Uh, you can go about a couple of different ways of circumventing that and still having some kind of ritual effectiveness. Yeah. I think the nuances, like you're mentioning, whether it be drinking from a shared horn or whether it be which is how we've we've done it. Um, if you know, if you're more along like the Anglo-Saxon variety, where it's I think it's a centralized horn or a centralized receptacle, and then everybody has their own individual things to drink from. Or if you do like what Eric's saying, and you know, which is a really neat suggestion, I think, is to you know have each member speak their piece or or or, or give their uh, you know, do their part of, of the Sumble ritual and then pour a portion of their thing into the well. Like, that's a really neat take on it. And I think it all ultimately, like you said, the mechanics of it haven't really, the nuances may be a little bit different. It, it, it's ultimately still accomplishing the same thing. Right. And essentially, Why? it doesn't even have to be, the central receptacle doesn't even necessarily have to be a horn. Well, yeah. Yeah. It could be a bowl. It could be it a. It can be a great bowl. It can be, yeah anything that will catch and gather symbolically it becomes the well and as long as you're maintaining that i i think you still have effectiveness i mean it's something you have to experiment with and try uh, sure. and it's only through experimentation that we learn what works and what doesn't yeah because i think like you say it's the, the why is what it is it's why are you doing it well i'm doing it because that's how my great 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 whoever did it okay but why are you doing it you know like what where, where is Where's your reason? Where, you know, what, what is the purpose behind it for you? And how is it working to maintain and build the luck? Which is what it's all about for tribe. So, I think that's really helpful. I think that that can be something for a lot of folks out here maybe wondering, what do I do now? Or how do we do it? Or not really sure what to do, don't want to do anything bad. You know, that sort of thing. You know, those questions that come up in a lot of our minds. This thing, I think it offers a lot of good uh, good suggestions or good places to kind of mull it over in your, in your head. So thanks for sharing. All right. Um, what else? Was this it? Was this, does this cover it for us? I think. <laughs> uh, nice. I think we pretty much hit most of the points. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean we, we've kind of run the gamut. I'm having to run through that list in my head of what we said we were going to talk about. I think yeah. we hit about all of it. Yeah, was based on the list that I got, it's it's uh, that that pretty much covers it. So, I guess it really leaves nothing else to do than to ask everyone watching here what you guys think and and was this helpful and what are you able to find throughout, you know, this uh, time of social distancing? Things that have helped you guys um, either maintain or or start a tribe. Um, share it, share share that with us uh, down in the comments and like I said before, be sure to subscribe follow like comment all that kind of fun stuff to eric's channel and uh midgard musings here so eric did you need anything out do you want to uh add anything else before we sign off 
I, mean, I think we are good. I just want to thank you again for having me on the channel. I always have a blast when we do these things, and I know the audience responds really well to it. So, guys, if you like what we're doing, if you like seeing us do these kind of collaborative videos and these little, you know, heathen breakdown talk sessions, uh, let us know. Hit it in the comments and let Jesse know that you want to see more and more and more of this, and uh, we'll try and do some cross-channel stuff. Uh, as everybody, anybody that follows my channel knows right now, I've got some stuff that's kind of up in the air at the moment that makes my my side a little uh, uncertain. So I can't really do uh, commit to collaborative stuff on my side right now, but that will change as things settle out. So I'm I'm looking forward to getting some more stuff over on my side of the channel too. So, uh, but thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for supporting both Midgard's musings and the Ravens Call. Uh, you guys are the reason that we do what we do. You know, we, we, we could very well just turn inner and focus on our own tribes and do all of what is, you know, obviously that's the most important thing to us, as you can tell from our talks on the channel. I mean, it's, it's hearth cult and our tribes are our most important focuses, but uh, there's still that little bit of us that wants to see you guys gain from this and grow. And I want to see future heathens doing really rad stuff. And so that, that's why we do what we do. So give us the feedback, show the love, hit like on Jesse's videos, share them around, let people see it. And uh, you know, don't be afraid to jump in there and, and ask questions and let us know, love hearing your stories and stuff like that. So uh, if you guys are interested, I do have a book out, uh, The Saga of Bjorn Thorlson. It can be found on Amazon, Kindle. Uh, it's it's a heathen storybook that covers some, some heathen values and whatnot in kind of a, a heathen fantasy world. Uh, it's very, very family centric, very, very, uh, you know, you some trolls and you get some spirits, a trip to the Vatier, stuff like that. So give it a look, see if you're interested and uh, show, show some love, man. Give, give yeah. likes and comments all over the place and uh, subscribe. Come on, subscribe, people. Yeah. All of Eric's information, again, is all down in the comments, including the link to his book, The Saga of Norn Burleson. I have it. I love it. Eric, I don't think I've done the, the, uh, the, the right thing and, and, and reviewed it on Amazon. So that'll be something I need to, to go do. But it is a fun read. I think you guys will like it. Um, and then, like Eric said, too, um, anything that you want to see from us, we both have contact information in the description area of our videos. If you have an idea, something that you'd like to see us do, shoot it our way. Um, if you're on Facebook, you can get into the Word Weaver Productions Facebook group, and I'm there, he's there, you know, throw an idea out for, for both of us or one of us. It's, it's always welcome, and uh, we, like to, we like to see that people are, are not just, you know, liking what we do, but are also interactive enough to want to be a part of it in some sort of way. So we definitely thank you all for that and appreciate all your support. So that'll wrap this one up for today, folks. Again. Wouldn't for you, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So thank you all for your ongoing and constant support. Hail, and we'll see you in the next video.